Okay, I'm Maureen Corrigan, and I have the pleasure today of talking with Walter Mosley for the National Book Festival. Uh, the theme this year is American Ingenuity, and really I can't think of a better person to represent American Ingenuity. Walter Mosley has written over 50 books, and we want to talk about a bunch of them today. <laughs> so, um, Walter, you and I both have the distinction of having been present at the very first National Book Festival. And it's just possible yeah. that I may have interviewed you there. Uh, I know I I know I had the pleasure of interviewing you years ago, either at mm -hmm. the festival or at the old Chapters Bookstore in DC. But we we've talked before, and it's really lovely to be able to talk to you again. Um, I want to start by asking about your life right now. I I know that. You're a big proponent of writing every day, of writing for three hours in the morning every day. Are you still able to do that with the pandemic? Or are you like a lot of people I know, myself included, feeling like we're kind of a little foggy these days and we're not able to speak, to really stick to our routines? Um, I, I, I write every day and I have been, I can, I can, and since the pandemic, there's been one day and it was a few days ago that I didn't write and I'm, I'm not even sure why. Um, but no, I, I try to write every day, three hours a day. Uh, I, I'm, I can be foggy the other 21 and I am, and I have been, it's been a while to like, for instance, start exercising again and, you know, eating the way I should be and all that stuff. But, but the writing I've, I've been able to do, you know, it's, I've been, I've been doing it for, you know, way over 30 years now. So. Hmm. You live in New York. I don't know if you're there now or not, but um, you know, New York is my yeah, hometown too. Yeah, you're in LA. I, I, now. I'm in LA, okay. uh, and and I'm here. Uh, I came. I was in a writer's room for this uh, television show called Snowfall, mm -hmm. and uh, but toward the end of the the writer's room, not at at, at the end. The pandemic, you know, started and you know, and, and sheltering in place became you know the thing, and and New York was doing so bad right then that I just decided, well, I'll stay out here. You know, there's a lot of work to do out here and, you know, people to talk to and every once in a while to see. So, um, so I'm uh, in Los Angeles, in Santa Monica. Which unfortunately isn't Indiana. doing so well now either. <laughs> yeah. Say what? Uh, I said, unfortunately, LA isn't doing so well now either. Are, are you mostly well, staying yeah, inside? It's, it's, it's having a rise and stuff. It, it, yeah, I, I, I don't think it, it's as quite as overwhelming as New York was at its worst. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. But, you know, and also LA, there's, there's so much space in LA, it's really hard to tell if anything's happening. You know, yeah. It's like, yeah. it's not like you're going to hear sirens going up and down the street through Brooklyn or Queens or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, right. right. But, you know. It's, uh, I, it, it's such a strange time, I think, for a lot of us who read and write a lot. Um, it's not that much of a disruption in our normal day, but um, yeah. it's more the surrounding atmosphere. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a, you know, like a world spirit going on, which is not necessarily in good shape. Yeah. But, yeah. but, um, but, you know, the, the writing is, you know, for me, the writing is the writing. And, I, you know, like I have some friends who are like painters, musicians are really doing a lot of work, you know. Uh, the, it, in a way, just to be able to be at home and to and to and to you know to write or to paint or to you know play, it's been really good for them. You know, it, it, it's yeah. a it's a moment of like you know uh, self discovery, a potential self discovery. You know, I mean, there's all these terrible things about it, certainly, but um, yeah. You know, I, actually, I don't even think you can avoid self discovery in this. <laughs> you do have to sit with yourself a lot these days. Yeah, um, and you know, in, in do, do or not do things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. In preparation for talking with you again after 20 years, <laughs> I went back and looked at a lot of um, a lot of what I have read and a lot of what I haven't read of, of, of what you've written. And I mean, your range is incredible. It, uh, of course, the detective novels. Um, political memoir, kind of uh, writing meditation, books on writing, um, Afrofuturist novels, uh, erotica. <laughs> you just, you know, you really do contain multitudes. When I, when I say, though, to people uh, the name Walter Mosley, and when I've told a few people, oh, I'm going to be talking to Walter Mosley, 
immediately the name that comes up is Easy Rollins and the Easy Rollins mm -hmm. mystery. So I, I want to talk a little bit about Easy Rollins. You began that series in 1990. Um, you've written, what, 14 Easy Rollins books? And yeah, I think it's 14. I mean, and then there's another yeah. coming out, uh, Blood okay. Grove, that's coming out in January or something. Oh, yeah. great. Great. And so you started that series, Easy is in post-World War II L.A., and then you brought it up yes. to 1968 with, with the last novel. Um, what attracted you way back when to the detective fiction form? Well, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing about, about writing and, and being a writer. What I had done is I'd, I'd written a book called Gone Fishing. Gone Fishing is about, uh, it's an, uh, occurs in 1939. It's uh, a young, you know, late teen, Easy Rollins, uh, young, late teen, uh, Raymond Mouse Alexander. And uh, they go on an adventure to this kind of mythical swamp town called Pariah, which is between Texas and Louisiana. And they, they go um, uh, to get uh, this dowry that for, for the wedding that, that Mouse is gonna, gonna have. Uh, and you know, it, it's a book about two young black men uh, coming of age, one, you know, who's kind of a romantic and the other who's a, you know, a, you know, a psychopath. And, yeah. and, they, and, they're, and they're, they're coming, they're trying to find themselves. What happens, you know, is that, you know, when I, well, what did happen? I wrote the book. I was very happy with the book. And I, and I went to a, a lot of publishers through my agent. And, oh, no, actually, I went to, uh, to a lot of agents. Uh, and they went to publishers. And, 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 and everybody said, well, this is a really good book. It's really well written. We really like what it says. But it's about two young black men. There are no white mm -hmm. people except one crazy white lady in, in the book. And, and the black women, though they're there, they're not central characters. And, and there's a simple truth uh, at that time anyway, I think 88, maybe almost 89. Uh, white people don't read about black people. Black women don't like black men and black men don't read. So who, who are we going to sell this book to? Um, and that was what they thought. And, you know, if you think something and you're in charge, then it's true. Uh, so th then I just start writing again. And I, I, I wrote, I was writing about Easy and Mouse as much later after the, World War II. It's in Los Angeles. And when I got about halfway through, I realized that it was a mystery. I, I didn't actually know that before. I was just talking about, you know, writing experiences. Uh, and that's how I ended up writing mysteries. At least some of it's the time. So <laughs> well, it, it's interesting what you say because, you know, I've heard Sarah Paretsky talk about writing the first V.I. Warshawski mystery. And part of the impetus for writing the book for her was that she wanted to break into the forum and claim it as a feminist forum and sort of mm -hmm. kind of get her revenge on Sam Spade and all these straight <laughs> white guys who have been dominating the forum. So you realize easy story was a mystery, but the form itself, historically, you know, there's Chester Himes, Rudolf Fischer, but it, historically, it, it hadn't been a form that was particularly welcoming to people of color, to really anyone, again, who wasn't a white, straight guy protagonist. So was, was there any sense of, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to claim this form? for an African-American detective? Was, was a political uh, purpose in, in your mind? Well, you know, I mean, it is political. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of hesitant to say, you know, that, you know, to, to kind of frame myself in that, you know, this political, you know, activist. I was, I was, uh, I wanted us to be part of history. I wanted uh, black uh, people uh, migrating from the, the deep South to be part of the history of where they were. And I was in Los Angeles then, or at least in my mm -hmm. mind. Um, so I wanted to tell that story because I wanted us to be in history because the only way we can be in history is through fiction. Nobody reads books about history, mm -hmm. not very many people do. Uh, and, and so uh, my intention was to, to write about these people, especially these men, black male heroes. Now, um, the, the thing is that that's political, 
If yeah. you look at it from the outside, well, that's a political move. But I wasn't thinking of it like that. I just said, well, I want these people who I love, who I, you know, I, I was raised with, who I, I, who are so important to be part of the history of the rest of, you know, where I live. And, mm -hmm. you know, so it's kind of, it, it wasn't a political decision. It was a literary decision, uh, okay. but it was, but, but there was a subject and that subject, I mean, really, honestly, it's impossible to write a novel that doesn't, a, a good novel that has, doesn't have politics in it one way or the other, but mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that, you know, I, you know, I'm writing uh, particularly that, you know, it, it, like, I don't think that Langston Hughes was doing that either, but that's what happened in the end. You know, he writes mm -hmm. enough mm -hmm. uh, books uh, about people who are having certain kinds of experiences and it becomes, you know, a, a political touchstone. Hmm. It, it seems to me we're living through another period with detective fiction where the form is opening up again. I don't know. It, it, like when you mm -hmm. began in 1990, there were a lot of writers who've since fallen by the wayside. Some of them are still mm -hmm. with us, uh, claiming detective fiction for gay and lesbian voices, for you know African American, Asian, Hispanic, um, and then it seemed to close down again. You know, and I'm just I'm speaking as a critic and as a, a, a great lover mm -hmm. of the form. It, it seemed like. And I love Michael Connolly, but it seemed like that kind of um, familiar figure of, of the white guy detective came to the fore again. And now we've got, um, you know, now we've got, again, like Joe Ide, uh, S.A. Cosby, whose who's novel Blacktop Wasteland I saw that you blurbed and I just reviewed and, and I love. Um, Steph Cha, I, it, it seems like it seems like the form Attica Locke is... Um, in the last few years has become re-energized uh, with, with writers and characters who don't fit, you know, the standard profile of what we expect the, what we've come to expect the classic detective to be. I, I don't know if you have any, um, if you share that sense with me or, or not, or, and if you have any theories about maybe why that is. Um. You know, it's, it's so hard to say because, you know, uh, uh, Steph and, and Sean and, you know, and a lot of people, they've been doing a lot of work for a long time. And there are quite a few people, I think, that have been getting uh, uh, published. Uh, you know, you, you do have the, the problem in publishing where uh, if somebody doesn't think that people are going to sell like like uh, Michael Connolly, uh, yeah. then then they're, they're not going to really back it. Uh, a, a little bit more than, than a year and a half ago. Um, uh, another uh, uh, crime genre writer, uh, Kelly Garrett, and I uh, started an organization uh, called Crime Writers of Color. And, you know, there's like over 200 members, you know, you know, you know, all, of all, all colors. And, and, you know, many of them have been writing for quite a while. Some of them have, you know, just started. I, I think that, that, you know, you need, you need to, uh, that push to get, to get into it. You know, and you need that excitement among the pu publishers, you know, like, you know, which you have like right now, actually, you know, uh, people are very interested in uh, books about black people uh, in America mm -hmm. right now. Um, so I I'm not sure that it it stopped and started again. I agree with you that there was a lull. that there, those people were still working. They were still thinking. They were still open. They were still, you know, reading my books, you know, uh, uh, reading Gary Phillips, uh, you know, uh, reading yeah. uh, Attica. Uh, and th th and that was you know very I think it's it 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 made people say well this can be done though it took a while to kind of get there again I don't understand the 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 the, the dip but it was a dip in publishing not in writers you know what I mean yeah. there were the writers yeah. there working the whole time yeah yeah and maybe maybe a dip I I thought maybe a dip in independent or those specialty bookstores I know in D C where I live. Um, we used to have two bookstores that just specialized in mystery and detective fiction, and they closed. So it, maybe there wasn't that, that support on the ground for people just starting out. It's interesting, you know. I mean, because that that can go one of two ways. You know, you can be you you could be uh, be uh, like that kind of uh, mystery publisher who you know just loves you know uh, Ed McBain and, and you know listen, and I like these people too, but you know, Joe, though that kind of writing, not another kind of writing. 
And, uh, and you know, some are very open, really want to open things. And the younger people are, the more likely they are to, to want to, to see uh, parts of the world that, that they've been made aware of that maybe the, the previous generations uh, mm-hmm. weren't aware of. Actually, yeah. you know, just didn't really know what was going on there. So, well, I know there's some black people over there. I don't know what they do, but uh, they're over there and I'm here, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I was um, I was looking at a book that you published last year, Elements of Fiction, um, ah. which is kind of um, I don't want to say it's a writing guide. It's 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 a lot of things. It's it's kind of memoir, memoir ish, but it also um, is reflective. Uh, you know, in terms of the craft of fiction. And I thought the first sentence of Elements of Fiction was so interesting because you say, this monograph is concerned with the hope of writing a novel that transcends story in such a way as to allow the writer to plumb the depths of meaning while at the same time telling a good yarn. And I thought, that's pretty, in, in one sentence, that, that's, that pretty much speaks to the power of detective fiction. I mean, you really can oh, plumb the depth yeah. and, and tell a good yarn, um, yeah. which, which is maybe to go back to why you could tell the story of E.Z. Rollins as a mystery, but maybe it didn't seem so appealing to the publishing industry before it, it was presented as a mystery. You know, the mysteries have yeah, that I- crossover appeal. <clears throat> Well, one of the great things about uh, the, the genre is that people read mystery and crime fiction because they want to figure out what happened, like either in, in their life, you know, on the streets at work or, you know, the story that you're presenting. And mm-hmm. so if, you, if, you, if you're like, you know, the detectives, a, a Chicano or a, a dwarf or, you know, or, you know, somebody from, you know, your, your mother's home country, Latvia or something. You know, people will read it and they'll learn all this stuff from it yeah. because uh, they want they, they're learning everything because they want to figure out the mystery. And so it, it, uh, as, a, as a political like kind of a vehicle, it's really great to reach a lot of people outside of yeah. your uh, community. Yeah, yeah. You've got another sentence. You've got many sentences in this book that I that I was underlining, but. Uh, I like the way you, you talk about plot as the structure of revelation, which is, again, yeah. kind of um, something that speaks to the mystery form. Although the, the, the plot heavy identity of the mystery, I think, has worked against it in terms of literary value, like like in the academy where I live part of the time, there's still this yeah. prejudice against mystery fiction. Um, I know. You know, I teach a it's course terrible. in mystery fiction, and it's considered the fun course in the department. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, and as if you know, uh, fun uh, can't uh, give you knowledge. You know, it's just like yeah. you know, enjoying something is is, is the is the best way you're going to get knowledge. Uh, it's yeah. the best way you're going to learn. Um, yeah, no, it's true. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I go crazy, you know, like I'm kind of in the literary community, you know, like and mm-hmm. um, and I, I just, you know, it really is. Well, you know, what's important is what John Updike was doing. And, you know, I don't I don't well, I don't like Updike's writing. So but uh, it's it's kind of exclusive. And I think when you have a, a genre that's re- very inclusive, very popular, then it takes a really long time, uh, you know, for people who want to own that 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 uh, real estate uh, to um, to accept it. But if you look at the history of literature, all the way back to Homer, all almost all of great fiction, a little different in poetry, but almost in all of great fiction. It was popular fiction. You know, it was the Three Musketeers. It was, you know, it, it was Charles uh, Dickens. It's Huckleberry Finn. Yeah. It, 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 it's, uh, you know, uh, Dead Souls by Gogol in Russia. The, these, are, these are things that people want to read because they're laughing. It's really fun. Uh, what the guy's saying is really true. Uh, you know, uh, uh, the Bronte sisters. I mean, you know, it, it's like yeah. Shakespeare. The, all of yeah. these people were entertainers. 
you know, yeah. and now somebody comes up to me and says, well, you know, I'm, I'm doing this deep uh, dive into this, you know, this uh, uh, person's, uh, you know, uh, personality and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make them look very real and very pedestrian. You know, I'm going, but why am I reading it? You know, and, you know, a lot of times yeah. there is no reason. Yeah. 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 No. It should be a call to pleasure as well as a call to all the other things we want out of literature. Um, I, I want to make sure to to talk about the book of yours that's coming up coming out in a couple of weeks. It's called The Awkward Black Man. And mm -hmm. a great collection of 17 short stories. Uh, you know, one of the things that struck me about this collection is that almost all of the protagonists are awkward black men. They're kind, kind of um, not at home in their own skin, so to speak. They're, they're shy or uh they're socially awkward i mean they're very different from from easy rollins from leonid mcgill you know your your detective characters in that sense and yet they're all loners uh, i mean they really seem to be um most at home being by themselves whether you know whether that's by choice or by social um ac accident so I, I love the title, and I wondered if you, you wanted to talk a little bit about the title, The Awkward Black Man. Well, you know, so many uh, black male characters who appear in, in all kinds of fiction and literature and, and movies and television shows um, <clears throat> have, you know, they have a, a, a great weight on their shoulders. And they're really, to a great degree, not always, caricaturized. You know, you have the best friend, uh, the, the pimp, the, the the criminal, the the guy, the guy who says, "I'm really smart and I'm going to be a really good detective." You know, whatever whatever these people are, it's not. You know, it's really hard to 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 go very far from from those kind of notions. Those people exist. It's fine, but the the thing is, is that. I certainly want to talk to somebody, you know, who who is a uh, is is a rap entrepreneur, but but and he's so good at it that he gets hired for this, you know, this uh, future of migrating souls because what they really need is a salesman, and he knows mm -hmm. how to sell stuff, you know, mm -hmm. or um, or or you have. Um, you know, uh, a guy who, who they say, well, you know, we'll give you this job, you know, because we need African Americans. They say, well, listen, I'm not an African American, and and they say. What are you talking about? So when I'm not an African American, man, I said you're an Italian American, and uh, and this guy over here is a Mexican American, and you and you give me a whole continent, you know? Where where am I from? You know, um, you, you have that the, those no the, those notions that 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 are very apparent and everybody knows about inside the black community, but uh, it, it's kind of hard outside, you know, that you have these, these no these ways of talking and thinking and, and, and that, that don't include us. You know, there, there's somebody passed a rule that we're African-Americans, you know? And so, you know, I actually know, uh, know of a woman, a young black woman who's uh, talking to her boss, who's a white woman. And she said, well, you know, being black and, and the woman, and the woman puts her hand on her arm and she says, African-American. Now here's a black woman just says she was black, but this guy, this woman is going to correct her and say, no, you know, and so I want to, you know, uncorrect that, you know, and, and I want to talk about all these characters who have lives who uh, we see in other literature and other film and, and plays and stuff, but we're not seeing as much in, in the black community. And I want to, I, I wanted to pinpoint. That. Yeah. 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 The example you just gave about the, the woman being corrected um, and, mm -hmm. and told she should refer to herself as African-American, of course, reminds me of the op-ed you wrote for The New York Times last year, right. Why I Quit the Writer's Room. And, um, you know, that op-ed was was sparked by a, an incident where you used the N-word in the writer's room <laughs> of a show you were working on. and you were reported to HR for, for doing so. And rather than for various reasons, you, you just quit. Um, I really would love to talk a little bit about, about that op-ed, which, which maybe you're tired of talking about, but it just seems, you know, you're, you're an intellectual, you think through these issues. Um, you were speaking out for free speech. You also gave the example of um, 
disagreeing with a friend of yours uh, who mentioned that Confederate the Confederate flag should be oh, banned. Yeah. You, you disagreed uh, with that opinion. And I wonder, you know, as as an intellectual, one of the marks of an intellectual is that you think things through and sometimes you change your mind or you revise your opinion in light of everything that's happening these days um, with Black Lives Matter. I wonder if, <clears throat> if, if you would, I don't know, if you, if you would still feel the same way, for instance, about the Confederate flag and Confederate statues and, you know, kind of if that idea, oh, if the positions you've taken are the same. Oh yeah, the position I took then is the you know, same, same thing saying I take now. I mean, and, and the idea of, of telling me what kind of language I can use, not because I'm a black man in America, but because, you know, I, I, I use language. Sometimes it makes people unhappy. Sometimes they love it. it. It doesn't matter. Sometimes somebody comes up and hits me in the head. Well, OK, I took that risk and somebody hit me in the head. You know, it, it, it's it, it's, uh, you know, my, my friend said, you know, that uh, that he was trying to get an organization together to, to make the Confederate flag illegal. Now, I agree it shouldn't be like in state flags. It shouldn't be in the, the government. It should be, you know, we got one flag. It's the United States flag. That's our flag. OK, you know, you know, we, or we have a state flag. OK, but um, but I'm not going to say, you know, that a guy, you know, can't have whatever he thinks, you know, is his identity. And believe me, if somebody has a, a Confederate flag in his heart, I wouldn't mind seeing it on his car uh, swinging in his front yard. It's OK with me. You know, uh, I, I think that that the uh, the the idea of, of the of the of the fr of freedom of speech, and I think a lot of time in America today, like you know, people you know correcting speech, telling people there are things that you can't say, coming up with rules of, of language that you can't use, even though that language is in the dictionary. You know, and I'm saying yeah. no, this is not a good thing because it's going to come back at the people who think that they're taking charge of it. That and that's the problem. You know, we have to protect everyone. Because that's you know what the Constitution says. You know, being black in America, having you know, refused the rights of the Constitution for centuries, and you know, uh, I'm I'm well, I'm going to really be committed to everybody having those rights because that's the one way to you know, make sure that I and mine have it. Have you thought about writing a monograph on this subject? I think it would be kind of timely. Uh, you know, I I've thought about it some. I haven't I haven't quite you know worked it through yet. You know, it's it's like, um, yeah. I you know I you know people got mad at me when I when I went around I, I went around doing uh you know uh, being interviewed and some some people got really mad at me uh for for saying these things and so you know you kind of have to do it in a in a, in a way because I don't I don't want to do it to make people unhappy. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't want to say, you know, that, you know, I believe that, you know, that that women should be be stalked and brutalized by men, uh, that that racism is just OK and we like it, you know. But, you know, we have it in the White House. So, like, not far away from where you are. And yeah. uh, I, I want to be able to. I, I, I want to be able to 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 say it in such a way that we're having a, a sensible conversation and not having, you know, uh, an impact yeah. head button. Yeah, hard to do. Hard to do. Um, yeah. We're almost out of time. So I, I, you mentioned there's a new Easy Rollins on the horizon. Can you tell us a little yes. bit about that? Oh, I'm so happy with it. it, it it's, it's a book called Blood Grove, and it really goes into Easy's military history. That oh. he takes on a case with this veteran, this young veteran from Vietnam, 1969, and uh, and he does it because he identifies as much with veterans and victims of war a, a, as he does with black people. He says, you know, mm -hmm. I've been through the war. I was at the Battle of the Bulge. I know what this is. And, you know, you just kind of love it. I mean, the, the, the idea of being of easy being able to do this, but at the same time, being a black man in Los Angeles, in 1969, which is which is not. I mean, it's a lot easier than 1939, but still, it's not mm -hmm. all that good, you know. Mm -hmm. It sounds great. I, I uh, look forward to it. And, uh, you know, just want to thank you for all the writing you do. It's it, it, it you may not always agree, but it's always provocative. <laughs> and I, I am always carried away by by the story, the detective fiction that you write. Thank you. Wait, thank you. I appreciate it. Thanks for the talk. It's been great.